Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This is a very special episode. As you can see, we are live in person. This is the Bridges of Meaning. Is that, is that what we're calling it? Bridges of Meaning Conference. Okay, we'll figure out the name later. Maybe I'll edit that back in. Um, I'm really excited because I have here with me Esther O'Reilly, Bethel McGrew, that's pretty wild. I want to talk about that. Some of you may be shocked about that. And Paul Vanderclay. And I thought we got these two together. I want to talk about Christian public intellectualism or how to be a Christian public intellectual. What is that? Is that a contradiction in terms? So uh, real quick, I want, to talk, I want to talk about the uh, unveiling of Esther O'Reilly. Can we talk about that? Is that cool? That's cool. Um, I was following you for a couple of years on Twitter, and uh, back in like the Paul Maxwell days when, when oh, Paul yeah. was still yeah, yeah. a thing, mm-hmm. unfortunately, RIP. Yeah. Um, he's but not dead. But he's not dead, but yeah. <laughs> he he's, deconverted. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and you were huge. This was crazy, and I was trying to figure out who you were, and we have a mutual acquaintance, uh, Nate Lawfer, mm-hmm. and yeah. Nate was telling me, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Bethel's got some, some attention commenting on Jordan Peterson. I was like, oh, that's interesting, so I tried to find you. I didn't find anything. But he knew the secret that you were Esther O'Reilly. Yep. Uh, what was the deal with that? You were, you were keeping your anonymity because you were still in grad school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I started blogging when I was only about um, 18, I think. I think I was 18. Um, and I was really sort of a niche blogger for a while, just, you know, just writing about music and movies and politics or whatever popped into my head. Um, so my folks at the time were like, well, okay, if you're going to write anything political – then don't put it out there under your own name, which was pretty smart. Um, so I kept that up for a really long time, and I started placing like a few freelance pieces here and there at, at Christian publications. Um, so then it, it, was, it was with the rise of Jordan Peterson that I started to um, get a little bit more of a platform, and some doors started opening. So there was this sort of uncomfortable middle space where I was actually starting to get attention, but I still wasn't quite ready to come out for behind the pen name because by then I was in grad school and I didn't know if my career was going to be um, in academia or a university setting. Um, so I was still trying to kind of uh, keep a low pro- profile in that respect. So I would even go on Unbelievable and I would have an avatar yeah. instead of my, uh, my face. So after a while, I, I started um, feeling like maybe it was, maybe it was time. Um, then I got my first job out of grad school, and I, I felt a little bit more secure. And I started to kind of think, you know what, it's, it's kind of now or never. I, I, I can't live my life in fear. I, I mm. can't live my life hiding behind an avatar. Um, I think it's time to just sort of be myself and let the chips fall where they may. So then last fall was when um, I decided to unveil. Yeah. So I just randomly went to Twitter and saw your name. And then, you know, with, with your, uh, your Twitter name, and I was like, what is going on? Holy cow. And then I put it together, like Esther, sounds like Bethel, O'Reilly, Mick Grew. Yeah, like, like yeah, yeah. First, first name Jewish, last name Scott slash Irish. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was perfect. That was my little joke with myself. It's so good once, once I saw that. And, and I know your parents work, and so I'm mm-hmm. like, that makes sense. Now I get it. Are you the, are you the chess one? Uh, well, I mean, my little sister actually is, is way better than okay. I am at this point, but I did play chess very seriously. Did you beat your father, or is that your little sister? In my a... little sister. I've never okay. beaten my father. Okay, okay. So she, she must increase, and I must <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and uh, those listeners will know Paul as well. He's been on my podcast several times. And in my head, I'm thinking, these are public uh, Christian intellectuals. If I say that about you guys, can you... Can you say that about yourselves without blushing? Can, can one call themselves a, a public intellectual, a Christian intellectual? Hey, Paul, why don't you go first? I don't know. I'd rather think of myself as a pastor. Okay. Well, you're in the public sphere. You're I am in about... the public sphere, and I do talk about intellectual things. Yeah. I'm, I'm not an academic. Okay. And that's one thing. Um, to, to mention his name since Esther and I have been talking about him. I keep calling her Esther because I trained myself. Yeah, Paul was yeah. very good. Yeah. Because, you know, if I, if I knew her as Bethel, I would like let it slip. Yeah. So, um, But Tim Keller always made that distinction, too, and I think it's, it's helpful. I think I don't know that our country has a good sense of what a pastor is anymore. 
Yeah. Pastors obviously deal with some intellectual matters, but I think when we think about intellectuals, we primarily think about academics, and I think that's a little different too. So, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what a public intellectual is besides someone who talks theory in public and mm. people seem to follow. Okay. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I almost feel like if you were to take the word public out of it, like I, I feel like I would be more hesitant to call myself a Christian intellectual right. than a Christian public intellectual. Yeah, because public intellectual sort of carries um, certain popular connotation. Right. Whereas um, I'm not an academic, you know, I, I, I don't have a, a field of specialty where I've, I've published papers or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, my parents are intellectuals because they, they are real scholars. They do okay. have a, an academic CV, and I don't. So I might shy from that. But when I think public intellectual, I think, um, okay, that's more like a thinky person in the public square, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, which could leave the door more open for generalists like me, which is, you know, that's what I am. I'm a generalist. So, yeah, I think I'm, I might be okay with public intellectual, but weirdly might shy from just intellectual. Yeah. So, did you finish your, did you, you did a PhD in math, right? I did, yeah. So, that's your area of expertise. Kind of, sort of, yeah. but, I mean, I... You don't speak on math. I you're, don't, you're I don't. equations behind yeah. us yet? I, I don't really. The, the, I mean, the weird thing about me and math is I, you know, I, I, I paid my dues, I went through this whole degree, um, and then I got to the end of it, and I realized I, I wasn't actually very good at it, <laughs> um, and I, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't really have the, the chops or the motivation to be a, a math researcher. I, I was really just kind of burned out with all of that. Um, and I just wanted to teach. So that's, that's what I do now. So I don't even, um, I don't even think I have PhD in my, my Twitter byline just because um, it's, it, you know, it's in math, which isn't directly pertinent to anything I, I write or speak about. And I never want people to feel like I'm uh, touting my PhD. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's important. Yeah, OK. Um, well, that's sad because uh, we were just going to ask you to lay out Eric Weinstein's uh, gauge theory for us in, in, you know, in propositional form, draw see, it up. Uh, uh, see, here's the thing you have to understand about, um, yeah, I mean, Eric and I, yes, we both have PhDs in math, yeah. but, but Eric is like orders of magnitude above me in, in that whole area. Like I could, I could not even begin to tangle with Eric yeah. Yeah. Um, in the math realm. So yeah, he's, he's got me there. Well, so something I, I wanted to uh, also talk about, and, and Paul and I have talked about this, is uh, apologetics mm -hmm. and, and Christian intellectualism. Um, Paul, Paul is, you've mentioned that uh, you, know, you have a different style of apologetics. It's not, it's not propositions. It's not uh, the Kalam cosmological argument. But it's, it's painting a picture, uh, being, a, being a Christian in the public sphere. Um, and what's the role, what's the role of, of apologetics in that? Do you, do you need to be able to give arguments for God's existence? I think people, when we're in a context like we are now, where the majority assumption is atheistic and vacuous, yeah. I think it's important to sketch out for people the plausibility of faith. And, you know, to pull in some verveki stuff, I'm a, little bit, I'm a little bit less skeptical about the propositional necessarily than maybe John is. Okay. I don't want to unfairly categorize him. But his main point is that the participatory, the perspectival, all of these things, I think, really much more build a plausible worldview and a plausible argument to say it is not unreasonable to believe that this world is the product of a good creator God. Yeah. And so I think apologetics is much more about plausibility than necessarily um, sophisticated philosophical arguments. Mm. Agree, disagree, what do you think? I, I, yeah, I like that very much. And um, I always, I tend to shy from the word proof. You know, people yeah. will ask me, can you, can you prove Christianity is true? Yeah. And I go, proof is a word that fudges, to use it. A Paul Vanderclay phrase, I, I, I come out of math where proof means something very specific. Right. So, um, yeah, I like plausibility very much. I think um, Christianity is a cumulative case. It's many, it's a, it's a web of many different pieces of interlocking evidence that come together to form a complete picture. Um, and as for, like, what's, what's the purpose of apologetics? What does mm -hmm. it accomplish? You know, I think, um, 
I think as I, as I get older and I, I see the sorts of um, the sorts of roadblocks that people kind of put up for themselves to uh, becoming Christians, um, I think really the main purpose of apologetics is just to leave people without an intellectual excuse, hmm. um, which does definitely does not mean that you're going to be able to argue them into the kingdom, which right. I think can be a bit of a straw man. You know, oh, you're into apologetics. That means you think you can argue people into becoming Christians. No, right. obviously not. Um, but I think you just you at least have to show, like Paul was saying, show that it's not unreasonable, show that it's plausible, and that at that point, um, people are going to do what they're going to do, and you just kind of have to let, let the Spirit work in their lives, let them let the Spirit work in their lives. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, I asked the question because I, I live in a lot of different spheres, uh, and one of those spheres is the Jordan Peterson sphere. And then in, I'm also uh, studying to be a philosopher, and I, I got degrees in theology. And so I follow people like your dad. And in that realm, not your dad, but a lot of Christian philosophers and philosophers more generally, they poo-poo Peterson. Oh, my goodness, you know, that charlatan and such like that. And it's like you guys— they're a bunch of lefties. They don't, <laughs> yeah, right. they don't get it. And I was actually listening to a conversation by you two uh, yesterday. And, uh, and Paul, you, you mentioned a similar phenomena in— Christian circles, that they're not jumping on it at least, that they should be jumping on the Peterson movement. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to bring those together and see, like, is there a way that we can unify these things? Or is like the apologetics camp over here, they're doing their things arguing still with the new atheism, whereas the Jordan Peterson type apologetics or Christian intellectuals or uh, average uh, intellectual dark web enjoyers or whatever, however you want to pit that, um, is there a way to bring these together or these separate movements? I think, you know, when Peterson, when Matt Delahunty came to Toronto oh, yeah. and Peterson sort of jumped in and crashed his show on purpose, he was on stage. I think Peterson thought he was going to, he had better arguments. He was a little sharper tool than Matt Delahunty. He was <laughs> just going to go on stage and sort of run it. And, and I think those interchange, interchanges demonstrated that people don't really work this way and conversations don't even work this way. Mm. And so I think even the conversations with Sam Harris, the first one they had in Toronto, I've often described that as Jordan would try to make an argument and Sam would just kick it over. And, and I don't even think an argument. It's kind of like two kids playing in a, a nursery. Jordan was kind of trying to build something, and can't, Sam would just kick it over. Sam didn't want to play. I don't know that. I, I want to. I don't want to disregard a formal apologetics because if there's one book that I've consistently promoted in my channel, it's C.S. Lewis's book on miracles, yeah. which is one of his clearest books of apologetics. And right. I personally have found that book to be tremendously helpful and important. But it, what it does is addresses arguments that undermine the plausibility of believing in a certain way. And yeah. so it has a role, it is helpful, but you know, when I look at people making life decisions, let's say about a life partner, pros and cons, you watch people make these pros and cons, should I marry this woman, pros and cons, and it's like, yeah, you're trying to satisfy a certain part of your brain, but that's not how you got here at all, and that's not really where you're going to make the difference. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, any follow-ups on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I love C.S. Lewis. Lewis, to me, sort of modeled the, the perfect blend um, of the, the cerebral and the, the emotional. So you have his books like Miracles, which... Um, I think really do a fantastic job dismantling shallow uh, naturalism. Um, but then with books like The Abolition of Man, he's talking about um, educational formation. He's talking about how to create men with chests. Um, and I think uh, I see Peterson as coming in and being that kind of a figure um, who's, he, he saw that we live in a, in a culture where we, our boys are growing up to become men without chests. Mm. and. Um, so Peterson spoke into that void in a very compelling way. So I think what we need to do today is to, to recover um, that holistic model where we're, we're appealing to the head and the heart simultaneously. Yeah. So um, formal argumentation, I think, has a role to play there. 
And I, I think in the Harris-Peterson debates, what, what was emerging to me is that, that Peterson was by far um, the, the deeper person. Um, he, he had way better insight into human nature, human psychology, um, you know, the nature of free will and good, good and evil and all that kind of stuff where Harris's worldview is, is just totally bankrupt. Um, but I think Harris had the edge when they would talk about the nature of truth. Mm -hmm. I, I think he, you know, when they would get into pragmatism and, and all that yeah. stuff. I think Harris did land a few good points, and I think there is still a need to, um, to address Harris that I think Peters does, doesn't quite have the tools to do. So I think you need somebody who can come along and, and deal with that, um, but maybe in a way that offers more than, say, a, a William Lane Craig. So when I, when I watched William Lane Craig and Peterson, um, you know, Craig got up and he had all his ducks in a row. He was very well organized. You know, he's the, the consummate debater. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of formal points, yeah, I think he was, he was right and Peterson was wrong. But Peterson was a way more compelling speaker. He was a way more compelling presenter. Um, and uh, so, I, yeah, I think, I think you need both. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that brings up another question is, um, I will pitch it in the apologetics terms and then switch it. So sometimes you hear apologists, Christian apologists, say, hey, we don't need uh, another million-dollar apologist. We need a million one-dollar apologist. Yeah, I think that's Jay Warner Wallace's phrase. And okay. I, I love that. Yeah. That's a great phrase. Well, so let's turn that to public intellectuals. And this is, gets weird because public, if, if, you don't, if, you're not, if you don't have a platform, maybe you're not public, right? It, maybe we can debate on that. But do we need another C.S. Lewis, another million-dollar Christian public intellectual, or do we need a million, one dollar uh, public intellectuals? If that makes any sense, you know? I, I think we need more saints. Okay. Because yes, what hmm. Paul said. <laughs> yeah, People, sure. love the Lord your God. <laughs> Doesn't mean, um, and even, you know, I, I have a beef with a lot of translations. Believe is a perfectly legitimate translation for pistis, but so is trust. Mm. And finally, it's, I think the book of James says this well, it's, you're, it's finally about trust much more than cognitively ascend. And that, again, you can't, it's difficult to trust without some degree of cognitive ascent. You need that, yeah. but it's insufficient, which yeah. is exactly the argument in the book of James. Yeah. So what, it's, it's funny that we have this conversation because when you look at, most of the influences that have made Christianity implausible for massive numbers of people, almost all of that is not argumentation. It's status and insinuation. One of the best things I saw on this was Dallas Willard. You can still find it. Uh, every time I play it on my channel, I get a little copyright ding from Veritas Forum. Nice. But Dallas Willard gives the gives the argument that you're walking through a you, you're walking through a campus. Of course, Dallas Willard taught at USC, and you're walking through with a young man, and there's another person, and all that has to happen is the person, the young man, expresses belief in God, and suddenly, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's all a, a matter of social status, yeah. Yeah. and that's much more that's about huge. plausibility. And so all of the undermining that has happened in terms of public plausibility about Christianity has by far been social pressure. Yes, yeah. What, everything Paul just said there is so true. It applies in so many areas, whether you're talking about um, you know, the Christianity and science debate, whether you're talking about reliability of the Bible. Um, it's just the, the pressure is so huge. It's just like taken as a matter of course that, oh, well, of course, you know, rattle off your, your favorite 19th century atheists or 18th century atheists or whoever. Of course, David Hume showed that miracles are, uh, yeah, right. I, I know, right? Well, you know, we just can't go back. The bridge is burned, yeah. yada, yada, yada. And um, so consensus is like the, the social pressure of consensus. And so for for a young academic who wants to be seen as respectable, right? When you, what am I going to do? I'm just one little young academic. Am I going to go up against the accumulation of consensus? Um, so I do feel like I really was blessed in that respect, having grown up as the daughter of, of two academics 
who were not afraid to butt consensus, um, <laughs> who, you know, who just told me, yeah, the consensus is wrong sometimes. Um, and you just got to be willing to stand up and, and say it out loud. Uh, so I think I'm pretty, pretty inoculated against that, that kind of social pressure. And I wish, I mean, a lot of what I do is trying to pass that on to other people, like, like trying to say, look, it's okay. Don't be afraid. Hmm. Don't be afraid. It's, it's okay. Don't, don't feel intimidated. Don't be pressured. Um, sometimes this just is wrong. It's and based on bad methodology, bad reasoning, bad argumentation. Um, so just be willing to say it. Yeah. So I think about the public plausibility. I wonder, initially, when you, when you first hear it, it sounds bad. It sounds like, oh, no, like it's going to be harder for, for our kids to believe on campus. But in a sense, those who believe have to believe. Like, they're doing it because they think it's true, not because they think it's, it's uh, going to get them a girlfriend, right? Maybe, maybe that still goes on in cer certain campuses and such, but it's, it, you're going to have to bite way more as the stakes go up. Is that, is the plausibility structure shift, is that necessarily a bad thing? Is it a, is it a blessing in disguise that we have richer communities now? Have you, th that maybe that's an empirical fact, right? But what, what do you guys think about that? I, I think we are undergoing a plausibility shift. I think modernity is receding. And I was listening to the King's North um, Rowan Williams conversation on Unbelievable. And, you know, King's North made the point that, you know, he was, he was into Buddhism, he was into Wicca. I mean, he was into all of these things. And, and this is one thing that Clay Rutledge has made a point too. When people sort of come out of modernism, they don't go into Christianity, they go into often a lot of junk religion. Sure. And that's, that's just basic human nature. Lewis in, in Miracles said, you know, pantheism is sort of the default human religion. Yeah. And there are reasons why I think we bias in that. And I think those, go, those reasons go all the way back to the Garden of Eden that we are we see that we are outmatched and we are small creatures and afraid and so we like to make up stories and and so in that sense freud is right but the pushback on freud has always been if uh christianity is wish fulfillment why would we wish for the story that we are given in the bible yeah. about us because we don't look so good <laughs> yeah Isn't there the criterion of embarrassment but yeah applied to us instead of the, the apostles yeah 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 well, so we, we talked a bit about the, the goal of apologetics. Um, now, Paul is, is, will not let me call him a public intellectual here. He's a <laughs> pastor, and we need more saints. But what, what then is the goal of the public saint? Uh, is, the, is the goal to leave people without excuse? Is it to shift the plausibility? Is it to, um, uh, you know, following your, your Dutch roots? Are we following Abraham Kuyper and carving out Christ's kingdom, taking it back? Maybe all of the above? Followers of Kuiper come in two camps and they don't agree with each other. Um, what saints tend to do is they, is they do disrupt plausibility structures that have developed. Hmm. I'm not calling Kierkegaard a saint, but Kierkegaard came up in last night's conversation. And Plausibility, Christian plausibility structures don't necessarily help in some ways, and that's part of what Kierkegaard's pushback against the, the Lutheran Christendom that he was deeply embedded in, that, that was a lot of what he did. Saints tend to undermine facile social agreements that are actually sinful agreement structures, hmm. and they they expose, I think, what Jesus exposed, which is that in this age, there's a strange combination of plausibility and the fact that living like Christ gets you enemies and sometimes dead. But there's a bigger frame, which Lewis tries to get at with the deeper magic on the table. Yeah. There's a bigger frame where actually Jesus is right, and the world is under the domain of a rebel who tries to cut deals, which obviously happened in terms of his temptations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so just to add 
a specific element of that. I, I like to call myself a Christian humanist um, because I think Christianity is the original humanism in the sense of um, recognizing the infinite value of mankind. Hmm. So um, the role of, of the saint, uh, public or private, um, is, to, is, is to embody that. Uh, it's to, to embody the, the love of mankind um, for, for, for the stranger, for anybody, anywhere who, who comes within your sphere of influence. Um, it's to, to show that that person has value, that person matters, um, in, in that way to, to embody Christ. So that's, that's what the saint is called to do. Yeah, amen. So in, in, in these kind of groups, uh, these meetup groups, these, uh, I always just call them the meetup group, but I've just come recently to find out it's Bridge of Meaning. Is that? Bridges of Meaning is, that was, just, was an atheist's term. Joey okay. came up with that for the Discord server. Uh, we're also now using a word estuary to talk about okay. these types of groups that can facilitate conversations that are next to the church. Yeah. They're not in the church, but often they're next to the church. Yeah. Okay. And real quick, I got to, is it, is it Beth Al? Because I've heard other people it's, say that. It's Bethel. Bethel. Okay, Bethel. Yeah. Boom. All right. Yeah. You guys heard it here. Um, so next to the church, this is, it's getting back to the goal of the, the pub, we'll call them public saints, so I get to pull Paul in here too. Um, is the goal to have meaning conversations, and if someone finds meaning in something that's not Christ, is that still a win? Or is the goal, you know, maybe it's getting at the, the role, how evangelical we are, I guess, but... What, it, is it still the, a win? Yeah. What something besides Christ? Um, there, there are things that can be stepping stones on the way to finding sure. meaning in Christ, which can be like sub wins, so to speak. Yeah. But no, that's a that's a great question. Like, it, um, if you find meaning in cleaning your room, and you stop there, mm -hmm. is that is that a win? They came to the they came to a meetup group, they found meaning for their life. At one level, I'm like, amen. I'm glad that you're not in a pit of despair. Sure. Um, and that's a, that's a good thing, Christian humanism. Like, you're, you're made in God's image. I want to see you flourishing. Yeah. I don't think you'll be able to flourish without knowing Christ. Right. Um, but if someone stops on the, the bridge or on the, the path, however we talk about it, before Christ, like, is that still a win? Sure. It's, How do it's, we think? It's yeah. still a win. I just want them to keep going. Yeah. Just keep nudging them along, you know. Yeah. Plato, Socrates, Socrates, Aristotle, they've all blessed the world. Yeah. There's God is generous with his gifts. Mm. Um, to, again, to bring Kuiper back in, it's common grace. Yeah. Um, none of this is, you know, antithetical to our purpose. Part of the reason that we have emphasized estuary meetups is I was just talking to Dave on the way here, who poor, poor guy drove all night. Um, <laughs> That's okay. And I was talking to Aaron this morning. Yeah. People need, if people are, you don't just, in, you receive a plausibility structure, but in order to incorporate, you have to process it. And if you're going to process it, it's going to take reading, writing, conversation, friendship. You know, you can, and with YouTube channels, you turn, you churn through YouTube channels. That's the way YouTube is set up. So they might watch Peterson for a while, then they'll find Peugeot, and then they'll find me, and then they'll, they'll go on and they'll find all of these other people. But it's the relationships in your life yeah. Yeah. that are going to be the place where you actually begin to, your life gets knit together. And that's where the million one dollar apologists right. really comes in, I think. Yeah. Because you can, you can watch a, a bunch of debates with William Lane Craig and go, wow, William Lane Craig is so great, but William Lane Craig isn't going to have coffee with you every week. You know, so you need to find a guy, um, and maybe he's not as cool as William Lane Craig, right? You know, maybe he doesn't have flashy arguments, but he knows you and loves you personally and is willing to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. So everybody needs to find that guy or guys, plural, in their lives. And that's where the church comes in. That's where pastors come in. Yep, 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 yep. Because, and, and actually, so... We don't usually put public saints together because we have an understanding that 
there's tension there. Yeah. That's why I kind of went public or private because I think of you know the hidden life, right? That's sort that's of right. What, yeah, that's what I think yeah. of when I think of saints. And yeah. and saints <clears throat> come in in many different degrees, and people will find probably in any any healthy little church a few saints that everybody in the church knows. Um, probably the specific areas that they are saintly and probably a few that they are not. For sure. Yeah, but so that all gets knit together in that plausibility structure yeah. because Christianity is to be lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I want to press you guys on that because I, I get the, the saints thing and, uh, yeah, we can live a, a, a quiet life. Uh, we can live quiet lives. Everyone's here because they know you too. Yep. Right? So not, not only this is a group that people meet and stuff, but... It seems to me like that is a role that has always been filled. Go back to Augustine or Church Fathers. Um, but, you know, they were more incorporated in the church, I guess. Um, I don't know if you guys would call yourselves parachurch or what, but it's, it's sorry to bring up those weird things. Mm -hmm. But you're not explicitly f representing the church. You, you're a pastor, but you're still, do you still have a, a bifurcation there between your public and private ministry, or do you, do you not make that? Well, I... I'm just as public on Sunday as I am right here. That's true. Do you the, put your sermons out on your YouTube though? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. The, we're still trying to figure out these new layers of sociality that we have with these tools. But you are right that Augustine, Cyprian, Origen, these were celebrities of a sort in their day. Athanasius, right. Yeah. Huge. But they were, but they're also known they didn't have the same tools or ways of being known. I mean, books had to be copied by hand. Yeah. They were very expensive. And the vast majority, you know, part of the reason that we have the distinguished thinky-talky scholar here named Chad the Alcoholic is because all of these thinky-talky things that we do just sort of float up. And a fairly small amount of your people in church really need that. And yeah. people who have that sort of capacity are a blessing to God's kingdom. Augustine, Origen, these church fathers were brilliant, brilliant men. Yeah. But what knit together the community of the church? It was the people that today share dishes, visit each other, care for one another, support one another. And that's, you know, that's the vast majority of who the church is. And that's really where the plausibility work happens on the ground, face-to-face. Right. -face. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think, um, yeah, I see my role. I'm, I'm very much an independent um, writer. I don't have, um, I don't have like, strong denominational loyalties. I, I like to jokingly call myself a high church Baptist <laughs> because I, I had this sort of little bit of everything yeah. um, upbringing. But one thing that that's valuable about that, I think, is that it gives me a bit of an outsider perspective on all of the insider conflicts. Um, so I think I am able to to see some things clearly and hopefully speak into the speak into them honestly, um, in in ways that other people maybe can't or won't. So I I think some work I do fulfills maybe kind of a warning function, like look, church, this. You know, don't don't go after this this false teacher. This guy is compromised. That guy is unsound. That kind of thing. Um, so there's that element to what I do. Uh, but then I also think of myself as a, a bit of an evangelist. In, in, in some ways, I try to um, pick up C.S. C.S. Lewis's mantle. Um, so I you know I, I try to write about art. I try to write about literature, history, in in ways that um, like Pascal once said. I, I want to make good men wish that Christianity yeah. were true. Um, so I, I think, I think both of those things are, are important roles for me as a writer. Um, but I, and I, I am representing the church in that I am a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. I'm writing while Christian, right? So I am representing the church. I am representing Christ. Um, but Paul does that in a more explicitly pastoral way as, as a pastor. But then at the same time, I try as much as possible behind the scenes <clears throat> to, um, to figure out that, that calling, okay, how can I be of concrete good to, to somebody um, in ways that I'm not going to talk about publicly? How can yeah. I find a lonely person who needs somebody to talk to? How can I um, be of service to a community? Yeah. We all need to be doing that behind the scenes 
because that is going to sort of invisibly ground our, our public work. Yeah, I think that's that's fantastic. It's also what we're called, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah. And sometimes uh, Christian influencers need to read that again. Like, <laughs> Here I am doing the good stuff, but I'm influencing people to show that we need to do this. Like, all right, man, let's settle down. Um, how about how about when the goal of evangelism is explicit? Does that does that mess with the group? Does that mess with the people? I, I'm assuming not everyone here is a Christian, but they know that the three of us would like them to be Christians, right? Like I, I think that's where Do where it. meaning does terminate. I think it's the truth too. I don't, you know, all of us think it's the truth as well as the best story because you don't want to. Who cares if it's the best story? Great, and then you die, and it's not true. You could maybe live a better story that's good, better for you. Depends on what you mean by true. Sorry. Keep <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're going to get into pragmatism now, and we're going to debate that. I'm here all day. Whoa. We, you talked about... <laughs> that's <laughs> I good. I do voices. That's so good. Paul, you talked about friendship. Um, we're supposed to be like Christ to people, and we're called to, you know, make this place like the kingdom and we pray that we, we should be praying that every day let your kingdom come let it be done here on earth as it is in heaven yeah. is friendship I want to get back to the goal like friendship does that goal of friendship through these kind of groups through these uh, public displays through public uh, intellectual activity is it is the friendship compromised by them knowing that we want them to be Christians? I don't think it has to be. Yeah. I think people, number one, we have a culture now where we are very reactive to mercenary motivations. Yeah, that's right. And we are, we are reactive to it because we live in the midst of an enormous machine that is constantly trying to woo us to a particular political party, to particular brands, to particular lifestyles. And so there's, we're, we're just bombarded by incessant mercenary appeals to join one tribe or another. Yeah. And Christianity is seen in that light. But at, on the other side, I think people fairly easily can deal with that if they understand that there is love and that love is for the welfare and well-being of the other. Hmm. And so, you know, my denomination, I'm out here in the Midwest for our synod. We're going to have a big meeting and there's going to be a lot of hurt feelings on both sides on all kinds of things. Yeah. And But if, in fact, we have relationships that are high touch, high context, where we can maintain a relationship despite differences, we still value that in this culture. Yeah. And it's a good thing that we do. Yeah. Because we are not simply the product of all of our different tribal commitments. We are more than that. Yeah. That's great. It reminds me of uh, our sponsor here, Athletic Greens. <laughs> 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 You're the bench therapy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I feel up. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk about movements. Um, people follow people. And pe I think most of us are here because of Jordan Peterson initially, probably. Um, and people follow him. But after the leader comes a bunch of followers who are not quite it. And I don't want to trash anyone in Peterson's circle. But there's several in this circle that are not Peterson that find themselves with a gigantic platform. And it's like, that, that is not Peterson. You can listen, but it's not the same. Um, and then the, 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 the figure gets propped up. Is that something we need to worry about in, in Christian circles? Is that something that, ha that you two have noticed of yourselves, p people coming along in your wake, representing your ideas uh, poorly or, or, or well, either way? I was, I was in preparing for the, the next podcast we're going to do with Aaron Wren. I did a video last night because I had to think through some of these things and find some language. Movements are sort of these around these emergent spirits. Mm. Um, and Rebel Wisdom 
terms. We've talked about egregores, some reasons I don't like using that term. So I'm going to use for now this idea of emergent spirits. And leaders are elevated by the group, but they also tend to be able to articulate and help that group coalesce. But we, we live in a very dynamic environment now where these things rise and fall. And churn is a word that's used by streaming services because you want to watch the Avengers and so you subscribe to Disney Plus, but then you watch all of their new Marvel stuff. It's like, ah, that's crap. So now I'm going to watch Survivor. So now I'm on. So, so there's churn. Mm. So people, you know, people find Peterson and they hear his stuff. And for a moment, that's sort of turns them on very quickly, becomes map territory, so then they churn. So then maybe they find Douglas Murray, or yeah. maybe they find Jonathan Peugeot, or John Verveke, or someone else. So they sort of churn through it. And that's, I think, fairly natural. But I think it also, it also demonstrates the importance of relationships because, and this also then ties into the evangelism, because Oh, I've, here I connected with this person over, over Jordan Peterson, and then I found Jonathan Peugeot, so I want to tell my friend Dave about Peugeot. <laughs> yeah. and, and so then there's always a dynamic relationship between these emergent spirit communities and the leaders that rise and fall within them. Mm -hmm. That's a very dynamic environment, especially now where... It's not just books we're sort of reading in isolation. We're watching these videos. We're commenting on these videos. We're debating these videos. That's, that's the situation. And this is, this is new, I think, partly just because of the speed at which the churn happens and the thoughts happen. So that, that's the context that we're in. Yeah. And other people are going to rise and fall and they're going to be up for a day, and then they're going to be gone, including myself. That's the way it goes. And that's, again, why I want to emphasize community and relationships, because those things will actually endure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, this kind of ties into points that you've made about institutions. Um, you know, Peterson is a single sort of mercurial lightning rod figure, but he he hasn't figured out how to build an institution behind him. Hmm. And that's what somebody like Billy Graham was able to do, right? Um, so, yeah, people were excited about Peterson. Oh, he's doing things pastors can't do. It's like, yeah, but pastors have the church behind him, right? And the church is, you know, however old it is, however far back you want to go for denominations, it's been around forever. It's going to be around. I mean, my gosh, I look at stuff like, like James Lindsay, uh, he has this whole Twitter shtick where he's like, I don't think Christianity is going to survive. Christianity is falling apart. Yeah. This is the end. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Nobody, I've heard this before. He asked you, James, just to yeah. kind of shut up. So, um, yeah, James doesn't get it. He doesn't understand that the, the church is the church victorious. It will, it will last. It will stand. Now, you know, you're going to have apostates. You're going to have people who claim to be Christians who aren't really Christians. But so, so anyway, um, I think that's what you want to always point people to. Say, you know, yeah, I'm here for a while. I'm going to try to be the best representative that I can. But we need to plug you into this um, received wisdom. We need to plug you into the, the church hmm. body um, because that's what's going to outlive us. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, just a, a couple more here I want to follow up, and then we'll open up to questions. Can you, oh, let me think, can you become a public intellectual, a public saint on purpose? Can you choose that? And, and ought you? Is that kind of a gross thing to think, I'm going to be in the public limelight? It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, as, long as, you're, as long as you're stewarding it well, um, as long as you have people who, who care about you, um, who can tell you if and when you're doing it badly. Hmm. Um, and so, but I mean, you just have to, you just have to not let the limelight own you. Hmm. Um, so I think, I think there's ways of doing it well, but I think you have to, I mean, it's, it's sort of like examining yourself to see if you're going to make a good pastor. Um, and, you know, are you the kind of guy who likes attention maybe, maybe a little bit too much? <laughs> if you are, maybe you shouldn't be a pastor. Um, it's something similar. It can be true. She looked at me when she said that. So. Since it, no, sorry. I was just <laughs> not intending to. Uh, Paul does, does great with this. 
um, yeah, I, I think like like any like any public thing that one can do. You know, it's sort of like it's interesting. I saw the topic Christian intellectual, and I thought there's a little bit of a connection to um, the discussion around being a Christian artist. Hmm. Um, you know, are we Christian artists, or am I just an artist who happens to be Christian? You know, that that whole. Yeah. Uh, Am I an intellectual who happens to be Christian? So I, I think um, it is very much like being a Christian musician or poet or writer or whatever. Anything can be done well. Anything can be done badly. Um, it's just how you do it and who you choose to have around you while you do it. Okay. What do you think, Paul? I, I think Jesus gives specific advice. When you enter, when you enter the room, take the back seat mm -hmm. and let someone else come and bring you to the front. Yeah. If you take the front seat and, you know, this, the steward of the party comes and says, why are you sitting up here? Go sit in back. You'll be embarrassed. Yeah. And, and there's very much. There's very a shot at all these people in the front row here. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to ask you guys to, to shuffle around. Now. Yeah. There, there's very much that dynamic in social media. If you really work hard to be famous, you may, in fact, be famous for something. Kim Kardashian is successful yeah. and rich and famous. Yeah. Do you really want to be famous in the way she is? Right. Maybe you do. Johnny What's that? Depp, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are pretty famous. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are very famous right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I knew who Amber Heard was before Everything this trial. I've learned about Amber Heard has been against my will. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think following Jesus' advice is it's good advice. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, the last question here before we open it up, when it comes to having saints strategically placed, can we game the system? Like, can we, should we look to put Christians on TikTok, on Instagram Reels, uh, in these different places and, and give them voices? Or is this like, a, hey, if you feel called to it, go there. Should we encourage people to be uh, public Christians? If they're, if they're gifts, you know, if they're gifts warranted, if... Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I do I worry about that kind of thing just because I think, I think so many times people go into that sort of thing thinking I'm gonna colonize, and they wind up being colonized, uh -huh. um, and I think I think people, um, people overestimate their ability to not be colonized. Um, we we see that in so many realms, and it's why I mean, my my folks will often tell people to avoid debates, like, mm -hmm. like young, up-and-coming, gung-ho Christian apologists are like, I want to have a debate with Matt Dillahunty, or I want to do this, I want to go on this atheist channel and knock down all his arguments, and my folks are like, don't do that. Like, please, we don't, we don't need more Christian debaters. Focus on, you know, read more books, hone your craft, um, don't, don't, get, don't get sucked into that, that whole world. It's, it's really okay. Um, and I think but, but people have good intentions because it's, it's like, but I want to be, and especially now with like TikTok and Instagram, well, I want to, like all the young people are there. I want to yeah. influence the young people. And um, I mean, maybe there's a space for that. I think Sean McDowell um, has some, some nice work in that vein. And, and yeah. Sean's a, a solid guy. So um, if you can do that, you know, God bless you. If you can go into the world of um, Hollywood or entertainment or whatever, or, or Nashville, the music business, and be the be the, the light in the wilderness, that's cool. But um, I would just say be very, very, very cautious. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think people are going to play around with stuff, and I think generally speaking that's okay. I don't think we have any idea what all this social media stuff is doing. And, you know, I use it. I obviously use it. Yeah. Um, but it takes time. I think we should be far more forgiving of anybody under 50 than we are. I, Tim Keller, when he, he was asked, why aren't you writing books? This is before he was writing books. He said, anything I had written in my 20s, I'd want to burn. Anything I'd written in my 30s and 40s was probably not ripe. And so he waited until his 50s to write. I yeah. don't know. I, I think I, <laughs> I was just going to bring this up. Yeah. I, I think people write a lot of garbage past their 50s, too. So I, I don't know. Name names. Who, who do you have in mind? No, don't name names. <laughs> I won't name names. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to say you shouldn't write because I think, I think <laughs> yeah. Esther actually is, and I've told her this, I think she's, she's a tremendous writer. She's got Aww. a real gift. Thank yeah. you. And, Thank you. And I don't think you'd be here if that gift wasn't recognized. And that's what I mean by let others, let others promote you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Proverbs, right? Yeah. Let another praise you, not your own mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank well, you. Amen to that. And um, I think, I think if 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 someone were to do that and were to say, I'm going to go on TikTok, I'm going to do this. Be plugged into your church, probably, right? Like have, have people praying for you. Have people checking in on you. Hey, show me your watch time on your phone. How long you been? 18 hours? I don't think so. Dude. You know, like, <laughs> like, have some accountability as well. I work yeah. with college athletes, and sometimes we'll pull that out. And I didn't have time to read my Bible. All right, let me see your screen time. You know, like, you had some time. And, and these are my bros. These are you. wrestlers. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Well, um, that was fantastic, guys. Thanks for, for going down the weeds and, and all sorts of rabbit trails. Uh, I want to open it up now to the, to the audience. If you got a question, raise your hand, and uh, I'll, I'll repeat it back into the mic. So who's, who's the brave one first? Pick. All right. If it is at the end of the day all about faith, then maybe plausibility is sort of like getting the escape velocity in order to let faith take hold. Mm -hmm. Would that be would that be a misunderstanding, or would that be would that be compatible with what you guys are saying? So, uh, yeah. So um, the question was about plausibility and uh, and not proof. And does plausibility uh, give us was it escape velocity? That was a great phrase. Yeah, the escape philosophy to, to escape shoot you up. Where yeah. It gets you to be open to sure, faith. to be open to faith. You can't just prove and be your way towards it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great way of putting it. And also, I, I like the fact that you say it's not deductive. Um, I would say it's inductive, but I won't mm -hmm. I won't get all nerdy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I really I really like that. Um, you you have to you have to get to the place where you're truly willing, you're truly open. Um, and uh, yeah, escape velocity is, is a great way to put that. And the, the thing about faith, of course, Sam Harris and his ilk are going to say, faith is belief without evidence, which, you know, Paul's had. I like, Paul, your, your analogy where it's, it's like, I have faith in the, the airline pilot when I step onto a plane. So um, I think our faith in God is like that. Hmm. But the, there still is that step that you have to take. There is still that, that step of trust because you're not going to be able to answer every question perfectly. I haven't answered every question perfectly to my own satisfaction. There, you know, there are a few loose ends for me here and there. So I just kind of have to rest in, okay, but I think this still is um, the sun by which I see everything else, to, mm. to quote C.S. Lewis. So I still have to step out uh, in trust, which I think that's what faith is. It's, mm. it's trust. I think it's helpful to think about Jesus in that Here's the Son of God talking to people, and what happens? Most of what Jesus gives us are not proofs of some things that we think are important in order for us to believe. A lot of what Jesus says are sort of destructive, shamanic disruptors that make people question things. So the context of our ability to engage the world is important in thinking about these things. Speaking the truth, well, so what? People, people are gonna take it lots of different ways. So that's the way that people and the world are. And I, plausibility is nice because it's a little, it's a little looser. You're not just gonna nail it all down. And a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about with respect to cognitive science confirms that in the sense of, let's say, combinatorial explosiveness. The world is massive. Our little brains can't contain it. And so what do we do? We do a lot of dead reckoning and getting this much and no further because we simply can't. Yeah, if I, if I had a quick point to that, I mean, one thing that, that my folks will encounter is people who will come to them and they're all distressed because they're like, I can't read all the things. You know, it's like you were saying, I can't, what if there's an objection somewhere out there that I missed that could be like the, um, the, the haymaker, right? That's gonna knock my, my faith down after all that work. And, and what my folks try to teach people is, you know, at a certain point you have enough, hmm. um, right? You know, it's, it's like you're sampling a loaf of bread, I'm doing the Paul hands. You're sampling a loaf of bread at a, at a certain point, it's like, you know what? You sampled enough. 
you, you know, just sort of rest in this going forward and you, you, have, you have a cumulative case and because of combinatorial explosion, there's gonna be infinite varieties of objections and no, you're not gonna encounter them all, but, but that's okay. At a certain point, that's okay. Yeah. Excellent, uh, another question, Sam. Um, you guys have talked about sort of the relationship between public Christian intellectuals and institutions. Um, with social media like YouTube and Twitter and Substack having virtually no barriers to entry, a lot of hmm. Christian podcasters and stuff like that don't have anyone's permission or need anyone's permission, really, to get going on what they're doing. And I think the three of you, to varying degrees, have risen just completely apart from any real institution, denomination, job title, etc. whereas the previously that wasn't possible. Parker, you sort of talked about, well, you kind of need someone at church who, you know, is looking over your shoulder, making sure you're not looking at YouTube analytics 10 hours a day in a <laughs> way. You know, uh, how do you foster a good relationship with an institution when nowadays you don't really need to if you don't want to? Well, so I'll, I'll just jump in on that. So I want to rephrase the question. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's great. So how, how do we uh, foster a good relationship between, uh, as a public intellectual, public saint, who, uh, who didn't get permission from the church, doesn't need permission from the church, but should probably have a strong connection with the church. I think that, that comes, that can happen with anything, right? Like you can always, uh, you know, the fool isolates himself to his own destruction. You can always do that. I think being aware, talking about it here and, and telling people, hey, if you have a YouTube channel, if you have a TikTok, if you have these type of things, invite people in and maybe give someone your password. Like if you have a hard time with that stuff, give them your password and ask them to check in on your direct messages. Ask them to do these kind of things. That that's goes with social media in general. But yeah, I think letting people in your church know, I have this, this, I have this platform and I'm trying to grow. What do you guys think about that? Can you help me? Can you help shepherd me? Can you ask me these questions? Because I haven't been getting sleep because I checked the stupid algorithm. Swipe, 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 swipe. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I and I do that. And so I need people in my life. I need my wife to call me out on that. She does. I need my brother. I need my family. I need people at church to know and to ask and say, how's it going? Okay, cool. I'm glad that your numbers are up. How are you doing with that? Uh, is your personality split amongst 15 different apps right now? Maybe don't use them all on your phone. Um, yeah, so that, that would be my advice. What do you guys think? I think ideally institutions are communal accumulations of wisdom and accountability. People achieve things together. The Manhattan Project. I've been lately reading a bunch of stuff from the Second World War. This is how we, I mean this building would not have been built without an enormous repository of human activity and accumulation. Institutions try to manage that emergent power in a productive and controlled way. We're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do anything without them and so we're going to have to make our peace with the downsides of those institutions as well. And I think we will probably continue in a cycle of building institutions, critiquing institutions, tearing them down or watching them degrade and build new ones. It's, it's gonna be a, a continuous cycle for us. And I think personally, I think we have to figure out a good mix. And so for me, it, given the institution, you know, Little Living Stones Church, this is a good mix for Little Living Stones Church. Uh, it benefits the church and when people ask how they can contribute to this my first answer is you know donate to the church you'll even get a little tax receipt you know to give something on patreon you'll get nothing yeah. so donate to the church go ahead and use that institution um but it's i'm a i'm a minister in the christian reformed church there are things i aren't going to say i can and can't say because the institution hems me in that's important it's good for me. It's also restraining. Life's, life's like that. To all my Patreon supporters, uh, please continue giving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So the, the question was pointing out how awesome my shirt is. Uh, Philip K. Dick, do Android Zoom of like sheep? Also tattooed on my arm. Some people think it's weird to wear both at once. Can't take this one off, so yeah. Um, and then uh, bringing up how, how Philip K. Dick wrestles with questions well. And are there questions for the Christian that they'll not be able to answer? I think probably for various, uh, various levels of, de uh, of degree. Like I think the Trinity is ultimately mysterious. I'm a, a Trinitarian mysterianist. I think that, uh, yep, we're going to go Trinity. We're just going to bash all the heretics in the room right now. <laughs> all, all the Unitarians. You know uh, who you are. Yeah. Um, but the, how about the incarnation too, right? I, I, the incarnation? Is that, is that still mysterious? No, it's not, I guess. So uh, I think that there are, but the, I don't think punt, I think, um, I think we want to work very hard to not punt to mystery too soon. I think it's warranted at certain points. I think we should do some hard work. I think we should hear what the scholars have to say. I think we should hear what the detractors say. I think we should wrestle with that stuff and not punt too soon. And that's going to depend on your, who you are. If you're a public intellectual, if you're out in the public saying you're a Christian, you probably be able to wrestle with that stuff, uh, go a little bit further before punting to mystery, um, because I think that kind of comes with the territory. But what yeah, do you, yeah. I, I, I try to wrestle with that stuff pretty openly um, in, in different things I write, especially um, uh, problems of suffering or evil. Um, I think there, there are a couple of variants on the problem of evil. There, there's just um, why, why does seemingly random suffering exist? Then I think there's um, a biblical version of that, which is why are certain passages in the Bible, um, certain hard passages in the Old Testament that uh, you know, kind of stymie us when, when we read them. Um, so why would God allow those in there if they're, if they're flawed and you know, get into the whole inerrancy debate there? Mm. Um, so those are things I try to be very, very honest about because I don't think it serves um, Christianity well if you just kind of you kind of tuck them away, or you sort of give paint-by-numbers answers, um, you know, you give the answers you're supposed to give, because at a certain point, people can predict those, and they're not really satisfied by them, so I think you have to just lean into some of the, the tension and the pain there, um, and I think, I think my own mom has modeled this very well uh, as, as she goes through different trials, so yeah, I think that's, that's a good example of, of something Christians need to be able to wrestle with. One of the nice things about being a pastor is that people let you into their minds and hearts and lives. And I have yet to talk to someone who is in their last years and have them, you know, pastor, that Trinity thing. Um, usually it's, did I really do well by my kids? If I had not taken that job or moved here or there, did I, what if I, what if I hadn't blown up my marriage? Hmm. And it's the Christian faith. And so generally speaking as a pastor, for most people, it's being able to walk with them into those questions and finally say that God is trustworthy and we are limited in what we can know about what he will do with your son, your daughter, your spouse, um, the way that you've spent your time in your life, but he is good and he is able. And it's, it's those kinds of things that for most people, that's, that's what they're wrestling with and that's where they need um, someone to come alongside. Yeah. Sam, how are we doing on time here? We're doing good. Okay, maybe a couple more questions couple here. More questions. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, as people who are very public, uh, how, how, what has been some of the, the, the most impactful experiences that you've had since, um, not only for the good, but for the state of the head? And how has it affected maybe It's, it's, a, you know, it, it's obviously a big ego boost to have people fly from different parts of the country to sit and listen to me talk hmm. uh, or to have lots of people like a video or something like that. 
I, I wrestle with the fact that, you know, I would, I would each of you, and, and this, this can sound so trite, but each of you are, you're, oh gosh, how to say this stuff. I would love to know each of your stories and love to know each of you personally and to be able to spend time with you because as a pastor, I know that in lots of different ways, God has been working in your life and he has done things for you and you have your pains and your joys and your struggles. And that combinatorial explosiveness applies to each one of you, you know? And part of the insanity of these new tools that we have is that, you know, now thousands of people know my name and listen to me talk. And, you know, five million views on YouTube and, I mean, the number of, of listened hours to me is just insane. But, you know, like, you know, how, how on earth can I do justice to Chad the alcoholic? And lots of people will know me and not a lot, not as many people will know you. Is there any justice in that? Probably not. Would they be better off knowing you than me? Probably some of them, a lot more. No, it's true. Yesterday I, yesterday I drove home and there was, I saw a guy laying on the ground outside of a house and I stopped the car and my wife and I got out. I said, let me deal with the guy if you want to go to the door, see if somebody's at home. I was passed out in his front yard drunk, young guy. And, um, you know, I could, there wasn't a lot I could do at that moment, but, you know, you probably would have a better chance at helping him because you know that story. And that is true of every single one of you in this room. There's not a lot of people in this room. So there's a weirdness to all of this and there's an injustice to it. And that's to me the hard thing because I can't remember everyone's names. I can't remember everyone's story. Some people are gonna be more special than others and it's too bad, but that for me is part of my argument, apologetics, for the age of the, the life of the age to come, where it's right there in Amazing Grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, I'll have plenty of time for each of you. Yeah. I can't add to that. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add just, um, it's been amazing to get to know some of these stories. Uh, just a broader swath of people sending questions and, and saying, hey, I think the way you think. That's pretty fun. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, like non-Christians, atheists, whoever, saying like, I, I agree with this, or I like your shirt, whatever. Like, that stuff's awesome. I love connecting with people. And then being able to meet people like you and learn from you, um, I've, it's just been amazing. There's the negative stuff, of course. Negative stuff's with all, like I had a terrible negative experience driving here with this lady, <laughs> and she was the worst. And she kept cutting me off, and I was like, don't, don't do that today. <laughs> don't be that guy. Don't have that story today. Maybe tomorrow we'll think about it, Parker, but just let it go. <laughs> but the, the public stuff's been, been awesome, just, just meeting people like Sam, too. Um, yeah, so how about uh, maybe, maybe two more questions if we got them? Yeah, in the back. speaks to basically everything we've been talking about regarding hierarchy and intellectuals and getting to know people individually. Uh, and I need somebody like Paul to communicate that to everyone. Paul, can you communicate the question too? <laughs> Hit it, please. I don't know, there's this crazy guy who drove here from California and wants to talk about Moses' father-in-law. So Moses, of course, is sort of, I, I love those desert wandering stories because the Lord and Moses are sort of like dad and mom with a very unruly family. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, says, Moses, what are you doing? You're making yourself crazy. Find some people with wisdom. 
How about the clan leaders? How about people who have wisdom and they can, they can try some of these little cases and you get the real hard ones? Is that what you're talking about? Which is right. And so part of, you know, that's, that to me is part of what I want for estuary in that, yeah, it's fun when Paul and Bethel and Parker come and we have a little shindig. But the real fun of this shindig is meeting each other. Mm and building relationships with each other. Because when I listen to people, and people kind of embarrassed when they say, yeah, I used to listen to you a lot, but I don't listen to your videos anymore. And they, you know, and they're a little, you know, and I should somehow be personally offended by that. And it's like, my wife doesn't listen to any of my videos. <laughs> you know, I'm not offended by that. But I hope you got something from me, and I hope that you have smaller groups of people with whom you can share life. Because that's where, I mean, I can't hold you accountable. I can't see if you're spending all of your time on YouTube. Maybe put the phone down and take a walk in this beautiful park. So yes, we do need to have, there's a reason that society sort of hierarchies play themselves out this way. And Jethro made a point and Moses need to listen, needed to listen. So. Uh, did I do you do did I do you justice, Jacob? Yes, <laughs> Does that make him Jethro? Is he Jethro in this? Uh, oh, me and Jacob. Yeah, last one. Well, yeah, um, you know, the whole public intellectual thing. Jordan Peterson was introduced as a public intellectual yeah. often, hmm. and and yet the spark that he lit in the dry hay field was political. Yeah. And that's all about polarization. Yeah. And that's what's happening in the church now, too. And that's what we were talking about with the synod coming up. Yeah. All those things going to happen. What, what does pull people together? And in your comments, Paul, often about uh, Jordan Peterson has no institution. He's got no boots on the ground. But, you know, you've got to get those boots to walk towards each other rather than running away from each other like C.S. Lewis and Vision of Hell and the Great Divorce, running, running away from each other. Yeah, is there a question at there? Yeah, what, what, what pulls people together? Okay, yeah, so what, yeah, what pulls people together? Their needs. I'm gonna, I, I have a few speeches I wanna make at this Senate. One of them is going to be, people might not remember what side you were on in this debate, but they are gonna remember how you treated them. Hmm. Because that's what people remember. And we should, if, you can, you know, you and I can differ about a whole bunch of things. So Jacob and I differ about a whole bunch of things. Trust me. But I love Jacob. And he loves me. And we enjoy each other's company. And it's in that space that Jacob and I could fight about a whole bunch of things, especially about how I'm managing my life because Jacob thinks I'm doing it wrong. But we can sit down and and, and share a table together and love each other. We, we can, but, <laughs> uh, so I think, especially when you talk about conflicts wi within the church, um, I mean, the, the Apostle Paul, I, I like the way that he, he lays it out, is that you're, you're, you're very gentle and welcoming and you break bread with people who are on the outside looking in, but um, you need to purge mm. from inside the church because a little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. Um, and that's always kind of the, the approach that I've taken. And Jesus said, I, I mean, I, I came not to bring peace but a sword. And so I think the, the terrible tragedy of false teaching is that it, it is going to divide people inevitably because um, truth is what it is. And so, I mean, there's truth and there's falsehood, and if you can't come together then inevitably you're gonna go your separate ways. So you can be as gracious as possible in that, you can be as respectful as possible, but I think there's, um, I think there's a limit to attempts to unify things that can't be unified. Yeah, and maybe, maybe like, a, maybe a triage or, or first, second, third type doctrines. Yeah. Um, where we're saying maybe, Politics is a tough one, right? But like, yeah. where, where does that fall? Is well, politics and baptism on the same level, right? Well, like, part, I mean, part of, the, part of the problem with false teaching is, I mean, there are people who are going to claim that first order issues are actually third or fourth order issues. Yeah. That in itself can be a form of false teaching. Totally, totally yeah. agreed. 
Yeah. Well, um, thank you everyone for, for your questions. Thanks for uh, being here. And, and thank you, you two, for, for giving us all your thoughts. Um, now go out and be Christian intellectuals on TikTok. Is that the, the message? That we're... <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, saints. Get, get, yeah, go be saints. Get plugged into uh, your churches. And there we go. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.